is a bottle with a wine. Uh, well, he grew up from a wine a winer, actually, and uh, also a very good uh, wine taster. Wine, the chemistry has a natural connection. <laughs> and he stayed there for another degree, or two degrees, from physics and also chemistry uh, from the same university. And got his PhD in solid state chemistry, from liquid to solid, uh, in 1981. And after that, he started his career uh, in the USA, he moved to USA. I still remember he taught me about the jokes uh, he talked about. When he was first time in USA, he drive uh, offset in the direction on the street. When he talks in English with strong French accent, the policeman becomes his, uh, you know, Better, you know, leading him to the place where he <laughs> wanted to be. <laughs> but uh, he started uh, his uh, you know, uh, first job uh, in the uh, Belcom as, uh, as a member of technical staff from 83 to 89. And then he becomes director of energy storage group at Belcom until 94. And from uh, 95, he became the head of the laboratory of uh, reactivity and solid state chemistry, the University of uh, Amen, associated with uh, CNRS, that is a uh, uh, French uh, organization. Uh, he stayed there until 2008, and he moved on to become uh, the high merit professor of chemistry at uh, the University of uh, Picardy in I mean and holding the in parallel the chair on sustainable energy society and the environment at the College of France in Paris and director of the new uh, LabEx, Sport X and the Hiding French Scientific and Technology Hub on electrochemical energy storage uh, for that network. From ninety uh, from uh, June two one three until now is the chair professor at the College of France, holding the chair in chemistry of solid energy. Well, with uh, such kind of career, uh, you must wonder what uh, are his achievements. Well, he has published over 650 papers, holds more than 80 patents, and more than 20 of them already licensed to companies. And he has been given more than 350 invited talks at international meetings or symposiums. And in terms of uh, citation, he has, uh, for SCI, got more than 100,000 citations with H index so over 120. So for such kind of achievements, there must be something going on with awards. That's the long list of awards. Starting with uh, the first one from uh, 87, that he got the Belcor Award of Excellence. And then Belcor Distinguished Member of Technical Staff, and the Belcor President Award, and the Belcor Fellow. That, uh, and then uh, after he, uh, well, later on, he got this, uh, received R&D 100 award for the development of rechargeable lithium magnesium oxide uh, carbon lithium ion battery in 1994. And uh, in 95, he received the Popular Mechanics uh, Award for Design and Engineering Award for the lithium plastic battery and also another R&D 100 award for the development of plastic rechargeable lithium battery in 1995. And uh, 97, he got factory technology award from the Electrochemical Society International. And he became corresponding member of the Academy of the Science in, in April 1999, that's the French uh, uh, Academy of Science. And then 
in 2001, it was uh, named the European Academy of Arts, Science, and Humanities. And he received Thomas Alva Edison Patent Awards and also received World Car Medal Award. Water, not World Car, sorry, Water. So that, that's very, very important. And uh, he uh, received also in 2004 an ISI Award for being among the top 15 French scientists the most cited over the last 20 years. And uh, he, received, uh, he was named the permanent mem member of the French Academy of Sciences at the, in 2004. And he received 2008 gold medal of the University of Picardy de Vach. And also got French legend the honor, just like the Order of Canada, Order of Australia, or in Hong Kong, we have this uh, uh, Maria, the, the biggest man in the world in France, in 2009. And uh, 2010, he received Japan Material and IMS Award. And uh, 2011, he received the ENI Award for Protection of the Environment, and also the uh, Pierre Sucre Prize. I don't know that, but uh, I assume this prestigious award at 2011 <laughs> from French Chemical Society. Uh, and um, he was uh, uh, nominated a fellow and became a fellow of the Royal Society in 2014. Well, we received the news uh, in Hong Kong, right? So in that year. So that, that, uh, and uh, 2015, uh, he was uh, given the award of IBA Eager Award, and 2015, in the same year, he received Centenary Prize from the Royal Society of Chemistry, and uh, he was also nominated at the University Catholic of uh, Rouen to held the 2016 uh, Summit Chair, and 2016 is was nominated and, re and received as uh, Catalan Sabiente Award from Spanish Royal Society. And uh, he also got uh, the awards from uh, India as the India ECI's uh, centenary chair. And I think uh, India are very creative. And there he gave two talks. One is a Faraday lecture, another is Newton lecture. So now today we have the pleasure to have him to give a uh, Distinguished Engineering Faculty Lecturer. Let's welcome Professor Terence Scott. Okay, so good morning everyone. And of course I am um, honored and pleased to deliver a lecture today on the energy related issues at uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And of course I want to thank Professor Guan Shen for giving me this opportunity. So indeed, Today, I am going to talk about energy, which is related to the field of batteries. We'll talk about energy for the simple reason that it is uh, our main today concern, and ba batteries are becoming the vital element of our society. As you can see, really, in the newspaper, a huge amount of media release about electric mobility, about alliance between companies about uh, production of large-scale gigafactory and so on. So today, and you may wonder why this is all about and what's really going on in the field of battery research. This is, a this is what I am going to try to do modestly today in order to give you a flavor of the type of research going on on the batteries and what else. So to do this, so I'd like my presentation is going to be uh, as indicated here. And first, I will give you some contangible metrics in order to understand today's energy situation, ease evolution, and the risk of climate change. Is there? Is okay? Uh, 
Oh, so you want to use this? So. for that. Oh, that is okay, right? But this one, this one, uh, this one for, oh, you need uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But I need to put it where? Yeah. You, 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 you just hold it. Just yeah. hold it? Hold it, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you could clip it here. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Where? Yeah. Ah. Clip it here. Okay, oh, okay, fine. Yeah, sorry. Just a second. Okay. Okay. So we are set up now. Okay, so let's uh, try to look at uh, what we are going to look at it today. And I'm going first to try to give you some kind of tangible metrics in order to understand energy situation, its evolution, and the risk of climate, climate change if we don't take into account the use of renewable energy. And of course, all in terms of large storage as well as large scale and a low cost. And then, of course, I will move into the beef supplementation that is going to deal with the attractiveness of battery for energy storage and here I will try to show you how science and innovation can make better and sustainable battery chemistry. And then I will conclude this presentation by a personal outlook of what will be in the future. So let me first start to give you some kind of basic and why finally we are facing this kind of energy situation. I will say, or let me recall, that everything Everything will start nearly by the 18th, 19th century discovery and the applications that does follow. Indeed, at the beginning, as initially, human beings could live and biomass as only the sole source of energy without any environmental impact since the CO2 was reabsorbed by the plants via photosynthesis. And this situation lasts until 1782, where the first steam engine appeared as done by James Watt. And this has led to the development of applications such as daily, the team strains, and so on. And this industrialization has then was intensified back to the end of the, I will say, 18th century or 19th century with the discovery of the lamp incandescent, as you can see here, as well as with the internal combustion engine by a French engineer, Etienne Lenoir. And this led to all the change and transport mobility, as clearly indicated here, as well as the new technology that have led to the fact that nowadays we are consumably using a greater amount of energy, where the numbers are rel relatively astonishing, where you can see this is a conception of 160,000 terawatts per year, which is equivalent to a power of 18 terawatts. So the question that you may ask is how this is going to be evolved in? The answer is indicated here. You look at the steady growth of the population that is going to pass from about 2.6.1 or 6 billion actually to about 9.5 billion in about 2050. And this is going to lead, of course, to some increasing energy demand, as clearly indicated here. Sorry, as clearly indicated here where you have 40% more demand from the industry, and together with increase on the city population, as well as a doubling of the car fleet and the street. And as a matter of fact, here, you are looking at the Champs-Élysées, back to 1909, where you have this horse carriage, and now you can see the car, or nowadays you are even striker and the street. So, you can see that we are going to have a huge demand of energy consumption since we are going to move from 13 terawatt to 18 terawatt. And of course, this is going to lead to huge amount of CO2 if we are not doing something, if we do business as usual. Means we are going to move from about 370 ppm to about 600 ppm. Of course, there are some solutions to this, and I don't know if you want to share with me, but we need to stop this stuff, and one of the solutions that you can see here is this one. I don't think that anyone wants to buy into this solution, 
but this could be a nice way to solve the issues. More seriously, I think a way to look at the uh, problems is to, this pointer doesn't work nicely. This to look, finally, and the use of renewable energy, which means that we want to move from our heavy consumption of fuel cells to the use of renewable energies, such as biomass, <coughs> solar, wind, and whatever. Why? Because when you do this, you know that all of these energy are quite abundant. For instance, the sun sent to our planet 10,000 times the energy that we needed. Or more specifically, in 90 minutes, we receive what we annually need in one year. But of course, here the issue is how to convert the solar energy into kind of a different vector, such as hydrogen, biofuel, or electricity. And the best way to do this is to convert this solar energy to, as you can see here, to electricity via photovoltaics. And we should recognize that the field of photovoltaics has been evolving very strongly over the last 10 to 20 years, owing to a sustainable fundamental research, the efficiency of the solar panels have now reached about 20%. So if you look at the situation, now the price of the photovoltaics is very small, since we can reach, as you can see, about 30 cents dollar per watt, or if you look daily at the storage per watt hour, you can see that now we have a number that can compete favorably with daily either carbon or gases. And I think the prediction are that within 2025, we we'll have in this case a price of two US cents per kilowatt hour. So you may say photovoltaic is going to solve our world. Not completely, because as you know, there is uh, some side issues with photovoltaic. And as you can see here, the side issues are indicated here, where I plot the peak power or the peak variation of the solar panel or a wind farm. And you can see this large reduction of the power. And this is, of course, due to the fact the sun does not always shine when you want it, and the same for the wind. So definitively, there is a need to get rid of this variation, which means we need to smooth this fluctuation. And the way to do this is storage. And I think, for me, the best way to do storage that I may know today is picture on this next slide. This is more or less indicated here. You can use either the wind or the sun to directly fill out this reservoir. And then, when you can really, the energy is already here, when you want to use it, you just need to turn the valve all the time. And I think a final or a modern diversion of this process is really going on now in Chile and northern Chile, where now there is a big project that we call the Vala Solar Pump Project, where they are going to use in north of Chile this kind of cliff, about 600 meters, where they are putting there a 600 megawatt solar plant that is going to feed up all the motors and the turbine to pump the water into this reservoir which is a 300 megawatt, and then you can use it. So this is more or less what is actually going on nowadays. And you can see here the cost. It will be about $1,300 per install kilowatt hour capacity. But bottom line, you will get about 7 US cents per kilowatt hour. Remember the number, because I will come back on the number at the end of this presentation. But of course, you know that we don't have this kind of situation everywhere, and we are limited a number of plants. So then why we need to look for alternatives. And among the alternatives that we are going to look at it, of course, is means to better handle the renewable energies as well as to favor the development of electric vehicles. And to do this, we need indeed to convert chemical energy into electricity. And of course, the best device that is going to do this are going to be the battery, as clearly indicated here. And here, since you have a lot of young people, you may think that finally the association of batteries and electric vehicles is totally new. It's not, as you can see here, since the first car that does operate on batteries, you need to go back to 1899, and this is from the Belgian Camille Genasi, which with this car, equipped with a acid battery, that he called also the jamais content, or the never satisfied and reference to his wife. 
was able to reach 109 kilometers with autonomy of about 80 kilometers. So this more or less was the situation. And the same goes for the batteries. The batteries are new. There is a long, and long story beyond it. And the story goes as follows. The batteries, here, it's interesting to see the way that they come out. They come out from this gentleman, that is Lodzik Albani, who one time was doing some cooking and with a, some kind of frog legs, where he touched the frog leg with a two different type of elements. And he found that the, the legs was kind of contracting or expanding. And what he did, he claimed the muscle produced electricity. And this, this story is interesting because it's always the same in research. You always have a colleague that is smarter than you and try to do the experiment repeated. And the colleague was the early Alexander Bolton. He did the same experiment, observed the same facts, but interpret differently. He claimed that it, it was the a pure coincidence of having these two different metals that were immersed in a kind of tissue muscle liquid that were able to produce electricity. And of course, you may have an idea, you need to prove it, and to experimentally prove, he designed this Volta cell, as clearly indicated there, which is the a stacking of zinc upper disk that you will be able pi along the early, this sequence as indicated there. So of course, this go back to 1800, and there have been a large amount of development since within the battery field. And here I try to summarize one of the most main technologies that has been developed, going to lead acid batteries, nickel canyon, nickel metal hydride, and at reaching here, the lithium metal batteries and so on. And if I want to compare these batteries and plot them as indicated here, I can use here the energy density as function of specific energy, where you have this well-known technology, and you can see that out of them, the lithium technology is the one that is going to give you the best performances. And I should say, the discovery of lithium technology has certainly been the greatest advent, advance in electrochemistry of this last century. So today, of course, and I'm going to take my example by looking at this lithium technology. And first, I'm going to show you how this technology does work. This is more or less what you have, all of you, in your hands. This is uh, these two electrodes, which are insertion compounds, which means materials that can uptake and release lithium if you want it. And they are separated by a non-accused electrolyte. So when you use your laptop or your, lap or your phone, what you do here, you daily measure the voltage as function of capacity. And of course, since you are talking a longer time, you want to have a large amount of energy, and the energy is coming from the surface area between this curve. Okay. And now, of course, as a chemist and as a scientist, we want to know how we can really tune this type of energy density. This energy density is given by a very simple formula, as clearly indicated there, the product of the voltage by the capacity. And of course, as a scientist, you want to know the origin of the two different factors, and the voltage is coming nearly from the band structure of your materials, because when you have a structure, you know where the atoms are, and the electrons are going nearly in a type of band. So the positioning of this band is going to be very important. And then, of course, the capacity is going to depend on the number of holes in the structure that can accept or release the lithium. And this capacity is given nearly by this formula, which is a classical formula where X is the number of electrons and M is the number of vacancies. So you can see, this will be only the two formula that I'm going to have in this talk. So it won't be too much, okay? So now, of course, we are going to see how we can improve the systems. Because what you want here is also to have energy efficiency. And this is a very important parameter, which means you want system in which you can recover maximum 90% or 100%. So, experimentally speaking, you want these two curves to touch each other. When these two curves will part too much, I think the system will be useless, practically wise. So as you can see, we have a lot of parameters to control here. And in the end I will say that the field of battery research is a multidisciplinary field. Means you are light on three pillars that are materials, interface, and device. Okay? And this will require large amount of expertise in chemistry, whatever the type of chemistry, organic polymer chemistry, 
solid state chemistry, and sphere phase science. He will also request a large amount of expertise and analytical techniques, which will, of course, electrochemistry as well as in situ characterization. And all his staff will take advantage of, of course, some guidance by theory. So you can see we are here dealing with a huge multiplicity field. But what is the most interesting for you and for me at least is the fact that the batteries pose fundamental scientific challenge emerging for concrete technology bottleneck. And this is very important, means we are going to have a ping pong game all the time between fundamentals and nearly apply science. Okay? And now, I think with the introduction, I want to move into the beef of this presentation, where I want to show you finally how science and innovation were involved in the quest for better batteries. And here, I will try nearly to separate this description at three points. And the first, I will show you more or less how to increase battery energy density, which means autonomy, which means the time that you can talk with your phone. And to do this, I will daily introduce a new material design, new concept, and move from lithium-ion to solid-state batteries, what is happening here. Then, I will handle the issue of sustainability. And I will show you again here what are the material processing, how can we use electrodes from biomass, and how can we develop a technology that has less demanding entire materials, which means sodium ion or aqueous system. And then I will bring you to the future and try to show you how to develop smart batteries, and which in this case I will talk about the next generation dealing with sensing and self feeding batteries. So this is more or less the menu now we have for the next about 40, 45 minutes. So let's start first to increase the battery energy density. So here what I put is a simple graph and we have the potential as function of the specific capacity and when you have energy density. So we have the only two types of compounds, a family of compounds that we are going to study. These are the polyanionic compounds where in this case we have an oxygen that is going to replace by the tetrahedra here and you have all these types of materials that were synthesized over the last, I would say, 10 years. And the advantage of these materials is they present some safety advantages but the drawback is that energy density is relatively slow, low. And then you have the this kind of layer oxide compounds as indicated here where you have high energy density. And today, for you, I will daily try to develop what has been going on in the last 10 years in these materials. In order to show you that the compounds that we are using today in our battery, by going back to fundamentals, we were obliged to come out with a totally new paradigm, a new concept of designing materials. So let's start with this layer oxide. Here is the structure, relatively simple, you see, very layer structure where you have the metal layers and in yellow, the lithium atoms. Okay? Now, for people who are not good crystallographs, you can remember this very easily. Take the French millefeuille. Where you have the early, the crust will be the early, the metal layer, and the yellow will be the lithium, the cream. Okay? And what the type of system that you have been using have been based on this compound, where so far, at the beginning, back to the 1990, you were using these materials and you could remove only 0.5 lithium. But with time, of course, scientists have tried to improve the system and we have used chemistry in order to increase the capacity and energy density. So the first amount of work is indicated here where scientists have started to replace within the metal layer cobalt by other elements such as manganese and nickel. And we obtain this type of compounds, lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, that we call the NMC phase. And they have a capacity of about 180 milliampere per gram. And these are the kind of compounds that a large amount of laboratory throughout the world are now working. And we have, of course, this kind of ternary diagram, kind of, where people now play with this composition. As you can see, we have NMC, 3 to 3, means that we have equal amount of nickel, manganese, cobalt. And nowadays, the stellar compound is 6 to 2, which means 60% of nickel, 20% of manganese, 20% of cobalt. And this is a compound that most of the EV are presently used. But therefore, there, are, uh, there is an, uh, an issue here that is related to the, I will say, the amount of material. And you can see these materials contain cobalt, 
And this cobalt presents, as you know, some kind of daily ethical issues. So then while researchers now try daily to decrease this amount of cobalt, and we are moving to comp towards composition, 811 and so on. Okay? But whatever you do, and this kind of material, you are limited to the amount of lithium that you can extract from this compound that is about one. So pushing this, trying to solve this limitation, we go back to do some kind of, I will say, solid state chemistry work. And with the idea, in this case, some teams, namely team of Jeff Dan and Max Akere, were, in this case, able to even push further the substitution, as you can see here, and now put even some yellow atom into this metal layer. And they obtain what we call now the lithium rich phase, where they have the composition here. You have three different elements, nickel, manganese, cobalt. And when you look at this phase, you can see that they have an increase in capacity. We remove to about 250 mA per gram, but you have several issues, such as voltage fade and so on. So at this stage, in order to understand what was going on in these materials, like a lot of time in science, you try to design model compounds. And we have designed this type of model compounds where, in the case here, we get with this type of formula for the simple reason that we can easily study the materials as we have a single redox center as compared to three redox centers. So when you prepare this compound, you maintain the layer structure, and you also maintain the electrochemical properties as clearly indicated here. And of course, through three or four years of hard work, we are able to understand what was the mechanism. And what we found is when you oxidize the materials, you have the classical cationic redox process. And then the oxygen of the structure does participate to the process. Okay? And this, I will say, this was the first evidence of a new ionic redox activity within this type of material. Okay. And this has led to a paradigm shift in the way to design materials for the future. Indeed, for about 25 years, this is more or less the way that chemists were thinking about intercalation compound electron materials. Only the cations that are kind of blinking here were participating to the redox process. Okay? Now, since it's the discovery, the situation is not any longer the same because now you can see the cations and then the anions are participating to this redox process. So, what we found by doing this, that we can nearly double the capacity of the material. Okay? So of course, now when you find something, the question is to understand why it happened and what is really the science behind it. Of course, there a large amount of theoretical work have been done, and I will not go through it. I will show you, just show you the result. As I told you at the beginning, the electric chemical property of this compound are associated to the band structure and the structure of the material. And indeed, when you look at the structure of material, you can see that in this case, we have some kind of metals that are not very nicely bonded to oxygen, which means that there is some oxygen orbitals do not participate in the bonding. To make the story short, if you look at the band structure of this compound, you can see that we have a drastic difference where here we have a single metal orbital. Here you can see we have this non-bonding oxygen state, and this is the states that are, go are going to give you this extra capacity, this extra electron. So this is more or less to tell you that and all the, when you design compounds, we know now what is the origin of this extra capacity. So having the origin of this capacity, understanding this new paradigm, then you can really move to exploiting this type of materials. And this is more or less what we have been doing. And again, when I say what a large amount of group in the world have been doing, and of course, we come out with a wide variety of compounds as clearly indicated here by playing with the structural dimensionality and playing also with the ratio of oxygen to metal that is going to control the number of non-P bonding you will have to this compound. And you have all these type of materials, as you can see here. And out of them, you have this one here, which turned out to be the highest capacity ever observed in interaction compound since the beginning of this material. Okay? So these are ways that you can open a new field. And I will show you that this new field it was even enriched by our new discovery, where, in this case, what we found that all the chemistry that we are doing with lithium, okay, we can do it with proton. And by doing a very simple exchange reaction, an acidic media at room temperature, 
we could prepare this compound, X3, AIRO4. And this compound enables us to make rechargeable aqueous batteries, where you can see here we could change 1.7 electrons. And remember what I told you before about these two curves, now they superimpose, which means that you have 100% efficiency. Of course, you are going to tell me this iridium is useless, and you will be right. But just to tell you that model compounds sometimes are quite useful. So this is more or less what we have been doing. And we can extrapolate this to all these type of materials. And as a matter of fact, we have done this stuff, opening a new proton rich chemistry that we are now exploiting to have a materials that cannot be, could be useful not only for electrons, but for other applications. And I just want to give you an example. Playing the same kind of game, we ideally were able to use this kind of ionic kind of compound, which is termed as a three-dimensional structure. Here also, we can play the track of exchanging lithium by proton, but we need to go to 120 degrees. And we obtain this compound, a new compound, beta x 2 io 3 And you are going to see that this compound is going to show very interesting properties, not for electrode materials, but for water splitting. Indeed, when you are looking here, the over potential as function of current, and we benchmark this over the most or the best material for water splitting today. And you can see that the material has the lowest over potential. We look now in the activity by benchmarking again. You can see that this new compound has again the highest activity. And of course, what is crucial for water splitting is the stability in acidic media. And since we have prepared this compound in acidic media, it's not a surprise that this material is stable in acidic media. So as of today, this is certainly the best materials for oxygen evolution reaction in acidic media. So this is more or less what we can do. But now, you know, let's keep track and let's go back to the field of electron materials. And what can we do with this kind of lithium-rich materials and this new paradigm? So this is more or less the type of compound that we have. And indeed, one figure of merit is that we can double the energy density. And you are going to see here that uh, having one figure of merit does not systematically lead to a practical application. There are several issues that we need to control. Indeed, these compounds are great, but as you can see here, you have the issue of hysteresis, the potential difference between the charge and discharge. And remember, energy efficiency is not too great. Then also, what we have is, as you are going to cycle this stuff, you see the voltage decay upon cycling. And these, again, are real troublemakers and trouble issues. So we need to solve the problem. And all again, you want to solve the problem, you need to go back to fundamentals. So we went back to fundamentals and tried to understand what was going on and to these materials, and to know if this problem can be really solved. In order to look at the voltage fade, what we have done is indicated here. You see, we take this compound where we have very small amount of voltage fade, and we design a compound in which the voltage fade is huge. And we nearly cycle the material for 100 times, which means that you have a huge battery 100 times. And we compare what's happening after locally. You can see here, everything remains the place. The atoms remain at the place. You have the air, the metal layer, and nothing between. Now, when you look at this compound, you see that atoms have been moved out of the main, of the main the early layer. And what is happening, if you look at the structure, is relatively simple. When you are going to oxidation, you see this blue atom here is kind of moving towards this octahedral size, and it gets trapped in tetrahedral size. So we found out that only a problem of cation size was responsible for this voltage fate. So this, of course, shown that we have find the origin of this voltage fade, and there we provide chemical clues to enable the use of lithium-rich NMC for the next generation of batteries. So this is more or less what has been going on on these positive electron materials. But of course, having these positive electron materials, you also need now to define or to find which will be the negative electrodes that you can daily uh, marry into a lithium ion cell. And to do so, there have been a great amount of work dealing with carbon. This is more or less what you have today as a negative electrode and most of your lithium-ion batteries. But there has been, over the last 10 years, a huge amount of work dealing with lithium-alloy interaction, and namely 
this type of compound of silicon. So this is great because you can see the capacity is 10 times greater that with carbon. But unfortunately, when you try to put this four lithium into silicon, you are, in this case, going to electrochemically ground your particles, and you are going to lose all the electrical contact. So here, people have really tried to do a large amount of science and more or less move to different strategy, which consists in moving to nanoparticles in order to release the stress during intercalation and prevent the cracking, or doing this kind of nanostructure to obtain this kind of composite that are indicated here when you have 90% of carbon and 10% of silicon. And this type of composite are entering the market now. Panasonic is making some cells using this type of negative electron. So this is more or less what is happening. But of course, where we are today? If we look where we are today, I summarize a little the evolution of the performance of the lithium ion cell as a function of time. And you can see here, we have the materials that I was talking, 622 versus carbon, we are here. This 811 versus silicium is appearing. Now, lithium rich in MC is the next generation, and we are here. But of course, people in the field, battery users, car makers, will like to have always greater energy density, and so on. So the question is, how can we really go beyond here? And there is a large amount of research here going on, looking at what will be the next. And of course, to do this, you need to look at new cell chemistry, new cell design, and I say, is really now what I will say is happening. People are looking, what they look at the, more or less the next revolution is solid state lithium ion battery. So let me take only a few slides, four slides, to convey to you what is the situation on these solid state lithium ion batteries. First, you need to know why this did happen. This did happen for the simple reason that battery is a business driven. And it's simply Toyota that make an announcement about five or six years ago now that in 2020, we should have solid state batteries in the car and we could replace even in the Tesla vehicle the present battery by solid state batteries. And of course, a large amount of company went, strategically speaking, to do the same. Let's go back to the science and let me tell you why indeed solid state battery have the possibility to increase this energy density. So now we are going to look at the system. We don't have any longer the aqueous electrolyte. You have this solid electrolyte. Okay? So it means that there is an advantage in terms of safety. means you don't have the really risk of explosion or inflammability. Then there is also an advantage in the way that you can put this battery together to assemble this battery together. Because now we can use what we call in our jargon this bipolar configuration in which now you have the simple current collector that can be sustained both positive and negative electron. And this enables you to have a comp better compact battery and a greater size. And what is very important here is when you use lithium metal here, you can really gain quite a lot in specific energy here, 60%, as well as in energy density. But be careful here, this only if you directly go to lithium metal. If you try to make uh, lithium ion solid state batteries, you will not have any gain at all. So whatever, why so much excitement? I think the excitement comes from the fact that there have been a great advance in material discovery of new ionic conductors. And you can see here over the years, and I think what makes all these changements is this compound that came out in 2011 where a Japanese group reports this compound which has ionic conductivity of 10 minus 2 cement per centimeter. This is a solid that can conduct as fast as, fast as sodium chloride into water. So it means that this is excellent electron. So this is great. But there is also some bad news. The bad news are the interface. In here, we have the only in yellow, the electrolyte, that is finally the complete matrix, and you are going to put here the active material on the side. So we have a huge amount of interface, and now the interface are more complicated. They are not solid liquid, they are solid solid. Okay? And this is difficult. So we are going to have a problem of air grain boundaries, a problem daily of lithium dendrite, as you can see here. And of course, we need, we need to develop a 
type of new chemistry or different chemistry, surface engineering, in which we need to make kind of uh, core shell particles or develop, I will say, a synthesis approach or pole coating approach to make this material. And I just want to illustrate with you what is the issue of this dendrite growth. To do so, I will just take this simple example where we have this kind of compound, so what we call the garnet, whose structure is indicated here. And this is a material that you can sandwich between two lithium. But as you can see here, this compound is an oxide. It has very bad wettability. So in this case, you are going to have a large amount of voids, a non-uniform surface, and you are going daily to promote the dendrite growth. And you can see the idea here by doing the simple current voltage measurement, where suddenly you see some spikes here, which are indicating that you are creating dendrite. And you can even observe the dendrite by operando microscopy, where here you can see you have a garnet grain, and you, can, and the, you are doing lithium and plating, and you have here the cracks, and with time, the crack is propagating, and then lithium is kind of infiltrating through it, and then it goes to short circuit the positive and the negative electron. So here again, these are the problematics that are huge that we have daily to solve within this kind of solid state batteries. There are approach where we try daily to modify the wettability and so on, but I should say these interfacial issues are a huge problem that takes a large amount of fluid. Now, if you look today, what is the status and their performances? Here, you have all the data that has been collected in the world on this type of system. I put here the performance of lithium-ion battery liquid, and you see all this type of data from Toyota everywhere, using either a titanate as a negative electrode or any other site. As you can see, none of them can reach the performance of the lithium battery. This is not a to total surprise, since we have been working on this stuff for only the last three or four years, but the difficulties are here. And I think what is more deceiving is certainly the cycling performances, where here you can see we are doing very poorly. And remember, if you take lithium ion, you can get nowadays about 3,400 cycles without any problem at all. So, bottom line, I think we should put some hope on uh, solid state lithium ion batteries. But I will say, you know, we have still a long way to go, either at the research or apply level prior commercialization. Okay? And the target that Toyota claimed for 2022 is totally irrealistic. So as a scientist, as you say, we don't want to oversell. We don't want to set up a necessary disappointment as we have done eight or nine years ago with metal air system. So this is more or less what I want to tell you about this type of system. But whatever, all the research have led to, I should say, the development of electric vehicles. Because because of lithium ion, as I mentioned to you before, today we, are, we have electric vehicles. And as you can see, this stuff is progressing very strongly. Since we have about 25 million cars by 2025, and we have daily more than 400 models around the world and that have been announced. So now the question that you may ask, since I will be dealing about sustainability, is it really the final solution by developing an electric vehicle? Did we solve the CO2 issue and so on? And I want really to warn you about this point as well. Because when you do this kind of stuff, indeed, if you look at the press, we solve everything. Now, if you look carefully what is going on, it's not so simple. And to convince you about this stuff, I am showing you here the CO2 emission for different types of vehicles. And here you see thermal energy. You can see, I will be simple here, is the amount that you do. Now, I will put the same graph for electric vehicles, but I will just really change the source of primary energy to recharge this vehicle. And this is what it is. And you can see that with electric vehicle, we can be worse than with thermal engines if we use coal fire plants as source of primary energy. So it's totally useless to develop electric vehicles if you are going to use energy coming you know, from uh, carbon plants. But of course, if you use the energy coming from renewable energy or, I will say, nuclear energy and so on, you are better off. But the ideal is, as I mentioned to you, if you can use the early primary energy coming from a wind farm, solar farm, and so on. And here you can see that now, look here. This, this is a contribution of the battery here. 
So the contribution of the battery is not negligible. And this will let me, will bring me to tell you what is really the battery and how sustainable the battery are. If you want to look at this stuff, this is a plot that I put to you that is some kind of study that has been known by several groups where you have all the steps in going from the minerals to the battery to, with its recyclability and so. And you can see here that at the end of it, look at the number. When we are fabricating, or we want daily to one kilowatt hour of battery, in that we can store one kilowatt hour, we need 327 kilowatt hour of energy, and we release 88 kilo kilograms. So which means that we need to do 327 cycles to break even. So you see, there is also issue of sustainability within the battery. And if you look at this, you can see that the issue is coming from material. So material-wise, here, there is an issue. So then why our research is evolving towards the design of better materials. And now I will move to the second se section where I want to try to increase the battery sustainability. So I will show you more or less here how we can do it by using material processing, developing biomass electrodes, as well as sodium ion batteries. So in this case, we have several trends. We tried, of course, to fight the sustainability, try to use white and abundant chemical elements from periodic table. We try also to develop, I will say, energy saving synthesis route, means not use high temperature ceramic process, but look, use low temperature routes as an indicator. We also try to use electrodes coming from biomass to replace our electrode using minerals. And we try also to look at new chemistry. And of course, today, we don't have time to go to all the different points, but I would like to focus on looking at new chemistry. And here, a large amount of work has been done to the world by investigating all types of battery technology. Of course, we have lithium ion, we have sodium ion, lithium air, lithium sulfur, redox flow, solid state batteries. All these systems are heavily studied today. But if you look now, the maturation stage, as I show here, you can see that none of them have reached the maturation stage today. There is only one that is only coming very close, that is here, the sodium ion battery, as I indicated. And this one white, I will simply focus now all, your all the rest of this presentation, or part of it, to a certain extent, to the sodium ion batteries. Why we have been working on this battery is simply for sustainability reasons. Because all of you know that lithium is less abundant than sodium. And sodium, you can find, is 10,000 times more abundant, I will say, in uh, Earth's crust, or even the early and sea and so on. But again, again, we need to develop new type of technology and develop the sodium ion batteries. And to do so, we are going to follow the same principle that we have been doing with lithium ion. We need to find new electrodes, positive and negative, and so on, and new electrolytes. So we have been working on this field for the, over, over the last five years, and I will show you a little where we are. So first, enter our materials. This is a sodium ion material that has been worked out over the last 20, 25 years, and just this increasing awareness of sustainability has driven all the different groups towards the world to work annually on sodium ion. And look here. In about five years, the number of materials that came out either as a positive or as a negative electrode. But gladly for us, there has been not been too much surprise. We are going to find the same family of compounds that we had for lithium ion, which means polyanionic, layer compounds, intermetallics, and carbon. And nowadays, there have been two systems that have been developed in parallel, which are these two systems, polyanionic compound, N3, v 2 po 4 2 time F3, that we call NVPF, and these layer compounds. And what I'm going to show you here, where we, what we have done in this system, fundamentally speaking, as well as apply-wise. So if you look at these systems, this is a classical type bat lithium sodium ion batteries, where you have your positive electrode, your negative electrode, and you make a full cell, a coin cell. When you look at it here, you obtain classical curve, cell potential versus capacity. 
And this is more or less, if you use it, the potential that you can get out of it. So when you look at this curve, with that bin in the field, you found there that there is a huge problem of energy efficiency since we are, in this case, losing 25% of sodium during the first cycle. And if you want to make a practical application, this is uh, no way to go. So we need to fight here and find a better way to do this. So to do so, you need really to bring somewhere in your system extra sodium that you can compensate for this 25%. So it means, scientifically wise, you need to design materials in which we can put extra sodium. So it means the idea here was to put extra sodium into this compound and get this new phase, sodium 3 plus X. But this new phase was not existing, so we were obliged to find a way to do it, and we have done it by doing some kind of mechanical milling, by reacting this NDPF with sodium to obtain this type of compound. So this more or less was a trick to go over this problem. So having done this, we were able to assemble the first sodium ion cell in the world, an 8650 configuration. And when we look at this cell, I think we have the good news was the first prototype we are showing nearly outstanding capacity retention and also outstanding power rate. So this was the good news, but the bad news are going to come very fast. Means now when we went to 55 degrees C, we found that our performance was a total disaster. Huge self-discharge, huge capacity retention, and so on. So at this stage, once again, the ping pong game between applied and fundamentals, we need to go back to fundamentals and try to understand what's going on. And we went back to fundamentals and we found that the main problem was in the electrolyte, and namely in the kind of linear carbonate that were decomposing during cycling at high potential. So then, having found the origin, always the same methodology, we try to design new electrolyte based on what we learn from the lithium chemistry, and we come out with what I would call this magic cocktail, where you have these four ingredients, where a new salt, this kind of double bond and triple bond molecules, and so on, which enable us to solve our issue. And the issue has been solved, and you can see here where we have the performance now at 55 degrees C, and you can see that the curve superimposed very neatly with very poor capacity decay and no cell discharge at 55 degrees C. And it is because of these results that on this we have decided really to create a company to commercialize this sodium ion system. But of course, this is what we have done. And since we create this company, we need always the same game to increase energy density. We have been working on materials. And I will, show, I will just show you two recent advances that have been done. One with our NDPF compound. This is the material that we have been using. And you can see here we have three sodium. And so far, we have been removing two sodium. So the question was, can we remove the extra sodium? Means that we can go to this compound, sodium zero, and we are going to create an extra capacity. And indeed, by having this new electrolyte, we are able to go to higher potential and to remove this third sodium. By doing so, we are able to increase, as you can see here, our energy density by 18%. Then, it's not sufficient. You want to go higher, and we try to go higher by again searching to new compounds. And here we tackle the problem of the higher compounds and see if we could stabilize a sodium compound that will be air stable and which we could have once sodium means stoichiometric. To make the story short, we were able also, we succeeded in making this compound, and here the compound would have succeeded, and later you can see we have increased considerably the daily the energy density. So bottom line, where is the sodium ion technology today? Here's the performance and look. We start with NBPF. We are about 90 watt hour per kilogram. Now we are going to use our track of sodium-3 to be about 120 watt hour per kilogram. And we expect to integrate this new layer oxide to reach about 150 watt hour per kilogram. Of course, here, we are not going to compete with lithium ion. So the market is going to be different. The add value are the high performance, sustainability, low cost, and one thing that I didn't mention here is a zero volt storage. The application, we have high power rates, so we are going to target the portable market, part of the electrical market, but of course, our targeting issues 
are directly the, the uh, sustainability and the grid and so on. So this is more or less where we are moving towards sustainability. And of course, there is another trend within the field that instead of staying with sodium or potassium or whatever, people try really to move to Accio system. And it's on why you have a huge amount of work nowadays on different Accio systems. And this is more or less all the technology on non aqueous and you are going to see scientists try to develop the equivalent and Accio system. Okay? And when you look at this stuff, you may ask the question, do is it as a sense? And costly wise, does this present some interest? I should really argue that in terms of cost performance ratio, it will be very difficult to beat really what we are doing today with lithium ion. And I think here we need to enlarge the operating voltage of the aqueous system, means that go behind 1.5 volt. And I think there is a new direction that has been brought into the field by what I talk during my classes uh, early this week about this water and salt of the super concentrated electrolyte. Okay. So this will conclude what I want to tell you about the second part of this presentation dealing with sustainability and how we were able to design better sustainable systems. Now, I would like to move to the third part of this talk, which will be more or less what will happen in the future and where we are going. So it means future research areas for making smart batteries, means for sensing monitoring and even self-feeding batteries. So I should say all of this has been nearly drawn by a person that all of you don't know is Elon Musk. Elon Musk in 2015 make a big announcement that batteries should provide electricity everywhere in the world at the lower price and when you are you want it. Okay? So he tried really to develop, he has developed, that is how he's working, this Giga Factory, as clearly indicated here, where they are producing huge amount, five billion of cell a year, okay, and in order to power electrical car and so on. And what more importantly, by doing so, is able really to predict that the price of the lithium ion is going to be lower than 100 watt per kilowatt hour in 2024. This is not out of the blue because other companies now, namely GM, have confirmed this possibility and so on. So this is going to change, I will say, drastically the business of people working or making batteries. But even us, as a scientist, we have to change the way of what we are going to work in the battery in the future. I should confess that materials will not be essential in the future. Interface will be more important. And let me tell you more or less way, the way that I perceive the future. The way I perceive the future is based on the way you can really lower this price. When you look at the model, or business model of Elon Musk, this is more or less a very simple equation. You have the chemistry material performance, and here he doesn't make any innovation because the material that he's using is NMC or NCA, which they use aluminum. So there is no breakthrough, no. And volume production, of course, is making a giga factory, and here he has advantage of the production, and so on. But here is also the battery second life. What does it mean? Battery second life, which means that uh, when your battery will be worn out in your car, you can now use, you give it a double functionality and use for grid application and so on. And now the problem is, if you want to do this, you need to have some traceability. Means you want to know, in this case, what is the state of health battery just like for humans, okay? Which means that in humans, you know, you can put a ship into human body to treat diabetic patients. You can use optical fiber in order to communicate from inside of the body, outside the body. And I think our future is indicated here. This is more or less what we want to do. We are nowadays putting a large amount of effort devoted to putting sensors within the battery, as clearly indicated here. Which means that in the future, the battery will not be any longer a positive and a negative electron. You will have also a third component, uh, output analysis, in order really to know what's going on. So we don't want this battery to be any longer a black box. And for this, there is another field that is totally expanding, I will say, is the sensing. We, put, we need to put smartness, we need to put optics, we need to put acoustic, plasmonic, thermo, as you want it. We are on open call here. And here you have a de design of what we want to do. 
we have this optical fiber where we have this fiber break grating in order to use a sensor for temperature or something else. So this is more or less where we want to go. Now, when we are going to achieve this, it's not over. Because now, like in medical, you know medical, if the doctor finds a tumor in you, he's not going to stop it. He's going to, at least to try to auto-repair and doing self-healing. The same thing what we want to do in batteries. We want to develop the early self healing process. And we have the same methodology. Remember, this is more or less our nightmare and batteries. This SCI layer that I talked very heavily for four or uh, six hours, well, this one prevents the lithium to cross over. If you look in the human body, you have the same thing to a certain extent. You have the clogged artery by cholesterol, what it is. In this case, it can deposit that is going daily to block your artery and so on. So we have the same problematic. So what we want to do here, we really want to design, as ma uh, sorry, as mentioned here, this kind of system in which we are going to introduce, in this case, molecules and so on within our battery to start with, and then we are going to be using a stimulus to trigger these kind of molecules and to go to repair the defect place within the battery. And of course, this is a complex but exciting science, which is a crossover of many disciplines. How we are going to do this? We are going to do this by exploring also a domain that has not been touched a lot within the field of batteries, which I will say is the membrane, the separator. This is more or less a dead way in your battery today. Okay? We don't do it. What we want to do, we want to take advantage of this stuff to create either this heterostructure, we want really to do functionalization, or we can really use this matrix to encapsulate what we call self in molecule that I can, I can trigger. We do this, we have started to do this, and we have developed, really, this is, has been developed already. You see more or less it's SiO2 particles in which we have really a PO rod in which we have threaded some cycle death screen here. And you can see by really doing this kind of bonding here, bridging, we can really bring back this polymer together. So we really are proceeding here. So what will be in 10 years, 20 years, Battery will look like. I am dreaming, but they are what I think is. This is more or less our battery system, and this is more or less our sensing. As soon as you are going to have a temperature increase, whatever, you are going to send a signal to the battery management system. This battery management system is going to activate the actuator that are going to provide the stimulus to trigger the release of one molecule to go to repair to the system. This is not only science fiction for you, but this is more or less what we are really working and what I am pushing at the European level to really to develop this big European flagship on batteries that will be really addressing this point beside artificial intelligence of entertainment. So this is more or less what I think the future will be. So time has come to uh, conclude this presentation and I will try to uh, conclude here by uh, two things. First, as a chemist, we are lucky that we have a periodic table and intuition will be still a nice game that I hope I can play for a long time and to develop new materials. Okay? You can see here, we can develop new materials, but unfortunately, out of hundreds of materials that you develop, maybe a single one will get into a battery product. So you want really, in this case, to accelerate this development. So we do, and people have been trying to do this computational chemistry, which means to establish a material genome and to model interface and so on. People have done by the FTA and so on. And now people want to introduce artificial intelligence to facilitate, to facilitate, excuse me, this discovery of material or this mastering of interface. But what, and I try to briefly show you through the presentation, is also important, is to see more or less locally what is going on. And I think locally, as you can see here, we have seen that uh, by microscopy, I show you how we are able at the atomic scale to solve this voltage fade and the lithium rich material. And my dream will be daily if we could do the same thing with the electron. And I think if one day someone designed a technique and so on to localize electron, this is going to be a revolutionary revolution in the field of electrochemistry, the same way that microscopy has been a revolution in the field of material science. Because there we can locate where the electron is going to go, we can locate transfer action and so on. And this will not impact only the field of batteries, but also the field of photovoltaics, the field of water splitting, since both 
or all are based on the same common denominator that are really exchange reaction. And of course, sensing and self-healing is the future. So with this, I still want to you and to leave with a, a one message. This, I hope that I convince you through the presentation that to work in the field of batteries, you need to have a synergy between the scientific and technology unit. And I think this is essential for battery research. But I want to warn you, basic research must prevail. And here I will make two quotations, one from a French scientist, which is Jean-Yves Cortot, who is a sonographer, was writing, applied research generates improvement, not breakthrough. Great scientific advance spring from basic research. The other one is Nobel Prize François Engler, fundamental research is needed to make progress, which you cannot do solely by copying others. If you only do applied research, you quickly lose creativity. So again, my message, please try to play a ping pong game between fundamental and applied. This is for me essential in the field of batteries, but in all other things. And with this, I would like to thank, of course, my institution and all my colleagues at the College of France who have been working. And I want to thank you. some work uh, on the organic molecules and organic electrodes uh, also targeting for sustainability. So could you comment on that? Yes, indeed. Uh, we have been working on these organic electrodes and uh, with great research, but uh, the issue is uh, was practical. And we could never solve it because uh, we are able to show that we can have uh, good performances with uh, organic electrodes around three volts. But the difficulty has been to prepare lithium-based organic cathode material, positive electron. Because you cannot be really oxidized while preserving the structure. So all of them are decomposed. So we are never able to stabilize the lithium 2 and lithium one that can be really hold the forward. So this is one of the second problems. So we are limited in terms of making lithium ions because we have a lack of this uh, positive electron highly resistant against oxidation. So this is more than one problem we have kind of given up this time. Besides the problem, but in terms of energy density and so on, you will not be as rich. But you could compete with your mind. Um, um, very interesting idea for using this uh, um, sensing to uh, create maybe the next generation of smart batteries. So I was wondering, because what you mentioned, the parameter that you mentioned that you can to measure is uh, temperature which is kind of straightforward. Uh, is there any other parameters you think uh, yes. that can be traced using sensing? Yes, definitely. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a discussion this morning with the uh, vice president, which is an expert on optical fiber, I think. And uh, what we can do, we can measure temperature, but we can also measure stress. Okay? We can measure stress, we can measure also uh, energy. So our dreamer is the temperature. I don't have, again, too much problem to do it. We'll do it. If, so it will be easy. Now, you can also, the dream is to measure the energy, uh, the stress. You want to measure the stress in order to control the energy, the SCI. Because you have vertical fiber, when you put the SCI on top of it, you are going to modify the stress, and you can detect more vertical fiber. But Estimation on the sensitivity that you would need to measure uh, this kind of stress? In, in temperature, we can go to 0.1 degrees. In terms stress. of stress, in terms of stress uh, I think there are people that are more as than me, but we, uh, I don't know if I can have the stress will be enough to more or less look at my SCR. Follow up question, sorry. Uh, so, this is actually uh, will we continue with this uh, uh, idea of cell healing batteries or the smart batteries. So for this kind of batteries, you really need um, a, a stimuli. So that is a change you can measure and that stimulate the changes in the chemicals or whatsoever that you pre-designed in the battery. So what, can you comment on what could be the stimuli that's going to induce the, the self-healing process or whatsoever? 
So, for uh, so, uh, so, uh, suppose you have an electron, you have a crack. You have, low, you are losing electrical contact. In this case, the LE you send the LE molecule, but that will the LE electropolymerize at this crack. And you make the condition. But I think, you know, in terms of sensing, uh, what is the most important thing? Okay, I think the sensor, we may identify them. The most difficult part is going to make sure that the sensors that we are using are stable within the chemical environment that we are working with. I think this is more or less the most difficult part for me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting talk. I'm not in the battery area, I'm in the fiber optic sensor area. Uh, a simple question is, uh, you're thinking of using FPG sensor in your battery. So the idea is just to measure stress or temperature or some other stuff. Yes, the first we have, we have to measure temperature. Because just to give, give you a little bit of you know, if you take electric car, okay, uh, you don't measure temperature. You measure initial cell surface measure voltage and current. And then from the voltage of current, of course, they get resistance. And from the resistance, they make an extrapolation of the temperature. But we have a single sensor and a module, which means we have a 16 cells. And they want, they do BMS. So what we like to know, which is very important, within the cell, only two, three points we can find. The inside temperature and the outside temperature. And how these two temperature change with the weight and values in the battery and so on. And then, if we, if we can't dream, if we are better about stress, yes, I would like to measure stress. But, uh, well, you can measure both using the FPS yeah. sensor. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you need to talk. <laughs> That's the expert on the fiber optics. Because, uh, interestingly, because I'm working with railway company, uh, they're, interesting, uh, they're interested to measure temperature uh, uh, of the battery in driving train. So, okay. much bigger uh, batteries. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, okay. Uh, maybe a personal comment. I think in 10 years from now, we'll be the same thing will be in the battery. So, it's no doubt. We are obliged. Hello, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Terrasco. Uh, is it not It's not out yet. Uh, press the volume one, please. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, for a sustainable future, uh, we can use uh, sodium ion battery and living sulfur battery. So my question is, do you think how long it will take for us to realize the commercialization of sodium ion battery or living sulfur battery? Thanks. I, th yeah, I think you know, I think the sodium ion battery can go very fast. Uh, by now, we need to prove the full potential of this battery. Okay? Because you know, we have done this stuff, we have created a small company, we are making a lot of amount of tests and so on, but you need to have a reliable product and so on. And uh, again, the sodium battery, I say, is um, we have good news and bad news. The good news is that uh, you know, uh, for the big company like uh, BYE and so on, if they want to move to this system, they can do it in six months. Because they have the same line, the same process that for lithium ion. Okay? Us, we develop this stuff. Uh, we know that when these big, big people decide to get into the business, we are out. So we just have our technology know-how, nothing else. But we don't care. One question from this side. We have more private time these days. Well, may I ask a question? Uh, yesterday we were talking about the, the uh, interface. Uh, so we had the uh, impression that the solid state battery is uh, far away from reality. But from today's talk, it seems uh, we are a little bit more optimistic. So. Uh, no, <laughs> no. I think uh, well, my team is still doing the same. <laughs> but you know, uh, we we we, come, we try to convey science. Yeah. And in science, you can never say never. Sure. Okay. I am my. Uh, yeah. I'm skeptical about you know the speed at which it's still developed. But I think uh, I think it may be feasible long term. 
but I will not say, you know, if you never have. Sure, well, you never say that. You have to be careful. Maybe I ask another question, because uh, for all this lithium-based technologies or sodium or so ever, so that basically uh, will be based on the migration of the cations, lithium or sodium. And there are recently research on uh, employing the migration of anions, so there are fluorines and, and things like that. Can you comment on the uh, these uh, research as well? Yes, uh, indeed. There have been, uh, but not a large amount of work that has been very going on with, uh, instead of using, uh, as a matter of fact, they call the technology fluor, uh, uh, fluoride iron. There was a work on uh, Mark Fischner, I think, in Germany. But uh, again, there are a lot of difficulties. Number one, or having the positive electrode is a negative electrode. And some of the materials, they do it either on the solid state, they want to do it at the solid state because you have a good fluorine iron conductor. But then, after they have, the, they have the problem of positive and negative electrons. So I think it's a very tough issues, and, uh, and uh, they give up, and they move to chlorine to play the same game. So it was a nice try, but uh, you don't go too much further. Distinguished lecturer, we have uh, Sonia from the faculty.